If you're an anarchist who's ever argued with a Marxist, you might have heard the latter accuse the anarchist of having no successful revolutions to point to. I'd like to unpack that argument and tie it in with the idea of left unity. It's not that we can't work together, it's that we have different values and therefore priorities. One problem with talking about successful revolutions is you have to limit your definition of revolution. Success is a loaded word in the context of revolution. Success by whose criteria? It seems to mean the people who aren't dead or in prison or in exile somewhat prefer the new regime to the old. It spends a higher percentage of its budget on hospitals and literacy. But why does everyone still have to live under a class of rulers? Why does living under so-called socialism still mean poverty and depression? I thought it was supposed to liberate. When they call something a successful revolution, Marxists mean there was a successful coup. There are still laws and borders and money and bosses and owners. To me, a revolution wouldn't be successful until all those things were eliminated from the world, all those uneven relationships. Until then, we shouldn't be supporting people perpetuating them. I keep getting told we need to support states that are resisting imperialism or are under siege from the U.S., but then their examples are either states that are patently not under siege, like China, or states waging war on their own citizens, like Syria. We can agree to support movement for Palestinian liberation, right? But if you can support them, why not also support Uyghurs, Kurds, Ukrainians, and all oppressed people elsewhere, everywhere. But this is what authority does. It teaches us someone needs to rule or at least be in charge of everything and, and that we can have these hierarchical systems, but that work for the people at the bottom. One of the most basic differences between anarchism and most schools of Marxism is anarchism stresses unlearning the ideology of authority. Only one system has ever carried out a worldwide revolution, a successful revolution, and that's capitalism. If the USSR or China were ever really socialist, which incidentally is something else I'd quite like to talk to you about at some point, that all ended 30 years ago and capitalism now reigns supreme. We should be opposed to all systems that necessitate class hierarchy. Hierarchy is the problem. That means opposing all aspects of this global system of nation states. That's why I wish everyone on the left would also unlearn using capitalist criteria for success. Especially with so-called AES, or actually existing socialism, meaning the states that call themselves socialist, Marxists will defend them with capitalist criteria, like higher wages for workers, or better home conveniences, which is less a remarkable achievement of socialism and more just what happens when a country industrializes. We get told about all these accomplishments, and I think, didn't all the capitalist countries achieve pretty much the same? What about Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, and so on after World War II? Capitalism can raise living standards too. The point of communism is not to raise wages. People in the USSR were no less alienated from the fruits of their labor, no more in charge of their workplaces than workers elsewhere. Likewise, Marxists demand we recognize the democratic nature of states like Cuba because in the most recent example, the government just legalized gay marriage and adoption. But what no one but anarchists ever seem to acknowledge is that means they were just prohibiting one fewer thing that they should never have prohibited in the first place. Why should a state have this kind of power? You might say, well, my Marxist state won't have restrictive laws like that, but unless you're the dictator, you won't have that choice. 
And if you were a dictator, you might find it pragmatic to appeal to popular prejudices and criminalize harmless activities. States monopolize making and enforcing laws. That means the people affected have no say. People have asked me, if we get rid of the state, how will we replicate the things the state does? I answer, we shouldn't try to replicate what the state does. We shouldn't be forcing people to adopt a system because we say it's better. We shouldn't impose laws on and tax millions of people. We should let them organize and do what they think is right in the absence of force. They don't need you or me or a boss telling them what to do. They don't need to fill out long forms and pay fees and wait to be permitted to do things they want to do. They don't need little bits of paper that say how much food and housing they're allowed. There's a lot involved in unlearning authority, which is always, you know, authority is always there whispering in your ears, right? For instance, Marxists ask things like, how would human rights be secured in an anarchist society? It's not a bad question, but it's not really how we think. The anarchist or communist ideal might be the stateless, moneyless, borderless society, but anarchism is more of a method and process than the belief in an end goal, you know, contrary to what a lot of people think. It's about striving to eliminate all sources of oppression. Human rights are a statist construct, mostly for the purpose of propaganda. When people are free, they don't need rights. When people live under a state, they have no rights, whatever the bits of paper say. Likewise, these successful revolutions are often touted as having brought literacy to backward peoples. Mm. Leaving aside the civilization versus barbarian rhetoric they sometimes use, like backwards peoples, the thing about backwards peoples is usually they're content living their own lives until the state shows up, forces them to settle, forces them to learn the official state language, and forces them to learn to read so they can absorb state propaganda of, about how they've always been part of this country. This is a very common theme throughout history. States forcing nomadic people to settle, and more recently, go to school for indoctrination and depend on state monopolies. It's really the last thing you should be bragging about. In fact, I would think in a free society there would be far more nomadic people, no need to learn the language of an empire, no obligation to learn to read so you can read lies and fill out forms, and no state schools to tell you that you're no good at things. I'll teach you to read if you want, but I'll let you decide. A lot of socialists aren't willing to admit that while socialism and liberation are not mutually exclusive, as socialism can be a vehicle for liberation, socialism could still just be, it could just be the name of the newest civilizing force, integrating unwitting people into a new social hierarchy. Some Marxists will hold up the USSR and a few achievements related to space or early mobile communication technology as some kind of proof that the USSR was superior or that, or that socialism can make technology too. Maybe I'm weird, but I don't care. It's using the same criteria as capitalists use. Growth, innovation, competition, the space race. They still believe in laws and censorship and prisons and so on. They're still stuck in the statist paradigm. They talk about socialist countries and communist countries, and yet when you press some of them, they'll admit, well, okay, sure, it, it wasn't actually communist, but it was operating on communist principles and working toward communism, and we just have to trust them. They're communists who love not communism. I think revolutionaries should offer a more enticing vision than slightly better conditions with less freedom. So when, when they say 
China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, they don't mention it was capitalism that lifted them, not socialism. Capitalism can lift people out of poverty in its way. We saw it throughout the 20th century. It mostly has the effect of shifting poverty somewhere else and destroying nature, but still, growth can lead to better lives for millions of people. It hasn't led to freedom from work or school or laws or surveillance or to popular control of the means of production, so it causes the same problems capitalism does everywhere else. But sure, call it socialism and big up China for successfully implementing capitalism with capitalist characteristics. It's this belief in authority and capitalism by a different name that leads me to think most people who call themselves Marxists will never change the system. They want to keep the state and most of its institutions. They want to maintain the interstate system, or if not want, then have already decided there's no point in fighting it. What's revolutionary about that? And when does the communism part come in? No, we're just being pragmatic, so we'll have to kill lots of people now and figure out the freedom part after a century of dictatorship. These people are not serious about liberation. They assume liberation is the end point of what they envision as revolution. But what it results in is seeing and thinking like a state concentrating power instead of devolving it to the people, thinking you can create the right system or society by getting rid of all the bad people, punishment and submission become goals, and all sight of the original vision is lost. Some people say, well, don't worry about your differences. Unite to fight the revolution and then argue afterwards. You're almost 200 years too late for that. On the one hand, it's easy to agree. We all hate capitalism and racism. There are plenty of issues we can and should sort of unite on. We shouldn't argue for the sake of arguing when it makes it harder to organize. On the other hand, there are some real differences among us, and they matter. I mean, do we envision the same post-capitalist society? Some on the left think we can't even start building any kind of society resembling communism until all capitalism, fascism, and imperialism have been defeated. Their priority is building a vanguard party that will take the reins of the state after the current one has been swept away. I'm not entirely sure I want to help with that. Historically, anarchists help carry out the revolution and then get imprisoned or killed when the new state consolidates power, and certainly don't get any credit. The system should be approached globally and locally. Local movements can resist local oppression while coordinating on global problems like, say, multinational corporations. But that's tougher to do when you're only willing to question some propaganda rather than all. How do we work together when you're defending part of the problem just because its flag is red? There are poor and oppressed people in every country under every state that could possibly exist. We need solidarity with them. How do I unite with people who make jokes about gulags, who obviously have no interest in freedom or justice, just a different configuration of power? What do we even have in common other than a hatred of capitalism? Everyone hates capitalism. It doesn't make you special. When you refuse to accept that people are trying to free themselves from tyranny, you will erase all their achievements. I can't count how many leftists have told me the U.S. started the Syrian civil war. When anyone who was paying any attention knows it was Assad and his crew that started everything in early 2011, to be followed by massive protests brutally repressed. The U.S. didn't get involved for a couple of years. These leftists didn't know anything about the widespread popular support for the protests or the local committees that sprang up wherever central governance was beaten back. The barrel bombs, the poison gas, the torture, must all be a CIA PSYOP, right? Except it's not. And leftists who support the Syrian government simply refuse to listen or learn. Once people have decided 
who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. They turn off the critical thinking switch and the violence dials start flashing. That's why we should oppose all authority, not just the ones our Marxist leaders say we're allowed to oppose. Now, for all the same reasons, for their refusal to listen to locals, their search for leaders and parties to hold up, their needing to know whose side the government is on, a lot of these leftists can't understand the uprising in Iran. They have no sense of solidarity, so they're not interested in listening to people who know what they're talking about. They just need to know that some U.S. NGO said something a few weeks ago, and then they have proof that this is a CIA color revolution. Couldn't possibly be human beings with agency rising up against tyranny. Must be the CIA. Or maybe it just doesn't count as oppression that we should care about, as Amina recounts in this thread. She says, I was in a webinar on Iran with some U.S. leftist people and was almost crying with frustration trying to reason with them. They say this is not a revolution because there's no working class party leading it in a place where there is no freedom of speech or freedom of assembly. They keep pushing that annoying phrase referring to the U.S. as imperialism and saying we can only criticize our own government, not realizing the amount of privilege you have to do to do that. You have to have. What, what if you're marginalized or have fi family that's marginalized in terms of immigration status, race, ethnicity, etc.? What if your family has been or is being murdered, imprisoned, or tortured by another government? A lot of these views come from high-profile leftists working for high-profile big tent leftist organizations that are more interested in gaining members and protecting abusers in their upper ranks than they are about solving problems. The Party for Socialism and Liberation, or PSL, notoriously even reprimanded one of its members for liking a tweet. Why would anyone join an organization like that? Clearly, if that party hopes to form the vanguard, it will be an extremely restrictive and bureaucratic revolution, which is not communism, or at least not any kind I want to be a part of. I don't think you should ever put your faith in one person or party or country. And I think Marxists suffer from this affliction. They label themselves after one or two or three great men. What, those men weren't flawed? They were so right about everything you would build a movement around them, not around certain principles or ideas or values. Their writing has to be complicated and turned into a science. One problem with basing your movement on people is their words can be interpreted and reinterpreted by people claiming to speak for them until everything they ever stood for is gone. I don't think I really trust half the people who call themselves communists because they idealize and carry water for states that are anything but communist and call you anti-communist if you criticize them. Nor do I trust these PSL people who call you comrade as if you were equals, but consider themselves your bosses. Criticism and nonconformity are part of the bedrock of freedom. As Emma Goldman famously said, if I can't like what tweets I want to, it's not my revolution. I don't mind having leaders in an organization, but when they act like this, you need to wonder what kind of society they have in mind. Some Marxist tendencies encourage the formation of a clique of philosopher kings who can be trusted with power as long as they follow the supposed science of dialectical materialism and never use their power in their own interest. I don't know, I don't see any of this as different from what we're promised about liberal democracy. We get told the system is designed in our interest and we're expected to believe it. It exists to build hospitals and power plants, not to discipline and punish like other states. The people or the workers are ultimately in control. You're free as long as you don't dissent. We already have all that. So what's the point of left unity? Is it just to absorb anarchists into all leftist movement and water down their message? Anarchists shouldn't have to compromise, but they're always expected to. 
We can unite in our critique of capitalism or to bash some fash, but if you're not for abolition, what would we do together? If you're going to not just tolerate each other, but work together, there are things you can do together, sure. How about this, as a hypothetical that, of course, I would never endorse because it's illegal and illegal means bad. We steal a rich guy's car and give the money, you know, sell it off and give the money to local mutual aid orgs that are helping the poor and organizing resistance. There you go, that's left unity. No long-term strategy needed. But there are several reasons the means and ends of anarchists and Marxists are different. There's a certain conservatism that comes with not fully unlearning the propaganda. That's not an insult. It took me a long time to reach these conclusions, but it's the same conservatism you see with liberals. People want to hold on to something. They think parts of the existing system that they grew up with are worth saving. As such, they might try to work through the system, whether legally by contesting elections or through a coup. The reason anarchists do neither of those things is they lead to reproducing the very system that is the problem. The point is, it's hard to work together until everyone has unlearned this system. Anarchism isn't about reaching some end point, because there is no end point. We think more in terms of values. Anarchists resist oppression and organize mutual aid. Liberation is a direction rather than a destination. After all, what if other people are right, and it's impossible to ever reach a completely free and equal society? Well, whatever. Anarchists will always be there to agitate for something better, questioning, resisting, inciting. So why don't more Marxists know about and acknowledge the historical role of anarchists in social movements? I'll let Margaret Killjoy answer that. All you anarchists do is organize book clubs and get into fights with chuds. How are you a proper leftist movement? Was a question I got asked by a pro-state leftist earlier today. So let's talk about the visibility and invisibility of anarchist work. First of all, educating ourselves and developing ideas together, collectively, book clubs, and taking direct action against fascism, fights with chuds, are fucking awesome. If that was all we did, I'd be proud to call myself an anarchist. I once gave a talk with Ursula Le Guin in Portland about anarchism and fiction, and her presence brought out a lot of people who weren't as versed in anarchism, which rules. One person was confrontational. Why do you anarchists show up and ruin all our demos? He was referring to the anti-war demos of 2003 Portland. It was the first time I realized how invisible our work as anarchists were. These demos that anarchists had ruined had been organized by anarchists in the first place. It was a coalition, to be sure, but anarchists were at every stage of organizing these anti-war protests. The peaceful ones, the rowdy ones, whatever. Student groups full of anarchists, old hippie peace groups full of anarchists, labor groups full of anarchists. See, anarchists don't always make a big deal out of our politics, because our goal is rarely make people conform to our standards. If we throw an anti-war rally, the goal is to be anti-war, not to trick people into signing up for our multi-level marketing scheme and pay dues. So the only visible anarchism might be a couple hundred of black bloc folks in a march of 10,000 people, even though we did a ton of the work to organize the whole thing. The same effect is true throughout all of our organizing. Anarchists brought the Western world the concept of mutual aid. Obviously, everyone was practicing it anyway, but evolutionary biologist Peter Kropotkin popularized the term as a way to understand cooperation. Anarchists don't make the coalitions they're part of, of <laughs> be anarchists, but we do often play a central role in forming these coalitions and creating the infrastructure for cooperation between ideologies. Occupy is a brilliant example of this. Methods we, among others, such as the Quakers, brought to the table like consensus building are what allow disparate groups to find how they can work together harmoniously to figure out what values we share and what values we don't. Anarchist organizational methods treat all individuals and groups as peers, and we're well suited to coalition building. 
but they aren't showy. Most mutual aid organizations in the Western world come out of the anarchist tradition. Food Not Bombs was founded by anarchists, for example, but they rarely fly black flags and roam around in black block. We rarely, for better or worse, create large visible institutions that are explicitly anarchist. Personally, I wish we did this a bit more, but I ain't in charge. But most anarchists are fairly transparent about what they believe when asked directly, so I've rarely found on-the-ground activists with much experience who aren't aware of how chock-full of anarchist social movements are. The invisibility of our labor leaves us overlooked and undervalued, and since the most visible tip of the anarchist iceberg is contentious, black bloc, street confrontation, sabotage, and property destruction, etc., it allows our ideological foes to demonize us. Yet I would argue the solution is the same as the solution to the devaluation of all invisible labor. Start to fucking value that labor. There's a parallel here to fundamental feminism. Reproductive labor is a terribly named economic term for the work that reproduces society but isn't generally paid. Housework, a lot of education of children, care for the infirm, settling small interpersonal disputes, etc., etc. This work is traditional women's work and is devalued by right-wing economists. I would argue that anarchism, and we're not alone among activists, has a tendency to focus its energy on this sort of invisibilized reproductive labor. In this case, the work that reproduces the social movements. And it's being ignored, as always. I think it's a confusing name for the concept because it sounds like we're making babies, which is part of reproductive labor, but isn't what the term refers to. Anarchists do a fuck ton behind the scenes organizing. We build and maintain movement infrastructure, social centers, info shops, mutual aid networks, community defense orgs. We organize and coalition build. Anarchists also read books and fight Nazis, and that's cool too. The movement doesn't have to call itself communist or anarchist or perfectly represent the ideals. Most anarchists support Rojava or the Zapatistas or the Black Panthers, which none, none of which are explicitly anarchist movements, but they could be categorized as libertarian socialists nonetheless, and they are helping secure each other's freedom and land. I wouldn't tell them to change. They're figuring it out. They'll change like all free and independent societies do, by general consensus. Whereas, if they had a single permanent leader or group of leaders with state violence at their disposal, that person could and would turn into a tyrant. Even if you liked their tyranny, they could get co-opted, bought off, tricked, or just killed. So instead of giving all power to one person or group, power should be evenly distributed to everyone. I think that's worth uniting for. Thanks.